The freewheeling attitude of the live for today because you may die tomorrow fighter pilot was epitomized by Marine Corps Major Gregory Pappy Boyington. His exploits in the air and on the ground made him one of the most colorful, controversial, and best remembered characters of World War II. By 1943, at the age of 30, Boyington commanded a squadron of marine pilots and was hailed as one of its top fighter aces. In the skies over the Pacific, Boyington's pilots tangled with Japanese aviators in a deadly duel to the death. It was man against man, machine against machine. But victory did not belong to the pilot with the most horsepower. It went to the man with the most talent and the most luck. Major Gregory Boyington and his squadron fit the mold of guts and determination. He was one of the few people that I've ever seen in my 30 years in the Marine Corps who was a born leader and could inspire people, not only through talking to them, through his flying ability. There wasn't a man in that squadron that wouldn't lay down his life for Pappy Boyington. He was a complete, total, 100% maverick. Boyington's autobiography, published in 1958, painted a picture of his squadron as a group of hard-drinking, hard-flying, and hard-fighting Marines more intent on battling their own superior officers than Japanese pilots. A successful 1970s television series on which Boyington served as a consultant went even further, creating an indelible image of his pilots as a collection of screwballs one step away from court-martial. Have the members of this celebrated combat flying squadron been misrepresented by the media and even by their own commander? Or is there some truth behind their brawling, larger-than-life legend? By 1943, the battle for control of the South Pacific was proving to be a difficult, bloody campaign. The battles of Coral Sea, Midway, and Guadalcanal had shown the Japanese to be tenacious, skilled fighters. Additional bases had been uh, established or were in the process of being established in the New Georgia group, especially Munda and Vela La Vela. And that was part of a stepping stone procedure aimed at putting land-based tactical air power within range of Rabaul, which was the major Japanese naval air complex on uh, New Britain, the largest uh, such Japanese facility in that part of the Pacific. Nicknamed Fortress Rabaul by American flyers, the chain of islands was defended by anti-aircraft guns and large numbers of highly skilled fighter pilots of the Japanese Navy. Additional Marine fighter pilots were needed to escort American bombers on their hazardous missions to destroy Rabaul. A stout, headstrong 30-year-old major named Gregory Boyington arrived at Espiritu Santo Island on August 14, 1943. He took command of a newly formed Marine fighter squadron. He had a tremendous background and started training us and his, his uh, methods were effective and very favorable. On the Marine Corps roll book, Boyington's new command was designated Fighting Squadron VMF-214. V for heavier than aircraft, M for Marine Corps, and F for fighters. Their aircraft, the Vought F4U Corsair, was a sturdy powerhouse of a fighter plane well suited to go up against the famous Japanese Zero. This deadly aerial contest of Marine Corsairs against Japanese Zeros combined to create an unusual and lethal kind of rivalry that the self-confident young American pilots were more than up for. Most of Boyington's men had at least a few years of college, and several were graduates of major universities such as Notre Dame and Princeton. The day after Pearl Harbor, I, with hundreds of thousands of other young men, left college campuses and went into the military because we thought that the country was in grave danger, which of course it was. The Marines and the press knew that the Americans back home needed heroes, and nothing creates heroes like competition. Major Gregory Boyington was the type who would fight at the drop of a hat, in the air or on the ground. If America was going to win the war, they were going to need men like Boyington, no matter how hard-nosed or undisciplined. Gregory Boyington was born in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 1912 to Charles Boyington, a dentist, and Grace Gregory. Within two years, his parents were divorced, and Grace took young Gregory with her to Spokane, Washington. 
The pair moved in with Grace's boyfriend, Ellsworth Hollenbeck. The common law family soon resettled in the lumber town of St. Mary's, Idaho in 1917. Growing up as Gregory Hollenbeck, Grace's son developed a pugnacious love of fighting, often challenging other boys to fights he couldn't possibly win. During the 1920s, aviation captured the imagination of many young Americans. Successful World War I pilots like Eddie Rickenbacker became heroes to millions of boys. Daredevil barnstormers thrilled audiences across the country with their aerial stunts and daring. It just seemed to be a, a lot of romance connected with the helmet and goggles and flying the scarf around your neck. In 1919, barnstorming pilot Clyde Pangborn performed for awestruck crowds in St. Mary's. Six-year-old Gregory got a ride in Pangborn's plane and was instantly captivated. By the time he graduated high school in Tacoma, Washington in 1930, he was known as a top wrestler, but quiet and studious. One day, after entering the University of Washington in Seattle, Gregory came across the Boeing Aircraft Company's new Marine Corps fighter, testing its engine along the Duwamish River. He saw this beautiful Marine Corps fighter and decided that it was something that he wanted to try to pursue. The chance encounter with Boeing's marine fighter steered Gregory into getting his degree in aeronautical engineering. While in Seattle, he met a local high school girl, 18-year-old Helene Clark. They were introduced and had some kind of a whirlwind romance. And they got married as soon as Boynton finished his college degree. He soon found himself the father of a son, Gregory Jr., and took a steady but unfulfilling job with the Boeing Aircraft Company as a draftsman. Gregory Hollenbeck would fight an uphill struggle to achieve his dream of becoming an aviator, only to see those dreams jeopardized by his self-destructive behavior. In 1935, during the hard times of the Depression, Young draftsman Gregory Hollenbeck still longed for a life of high-flying aerial adventure. That same year, Congress passed the Aviation Cadet Act, which funded the training of 1,000 military pilots. Hollenbeck seized on this opportunity to fulfill his dream of flying, only to learn that he had to be a bachelor to be accepted. But this temporary roadblock would lead him to a fortuitous discovery. In the process of getting his birth certificate, he realized that his real name as Greg Boynton was unknown to anybody as far as whether or not he was married. From that point, Gregory Hollenbeck became Gregory Boynton. He was accepted as a Marine Aviation Cadet in January of 1936 and left his wife and son in Seattle to attend Naval Aviation Flight School in Pensacola, Florida. He was 23 years old. A slow learner, he failed nine flight checks and often had to defend himself in front of a review board to continue with his training. But he proved to be an instinctive and aggressive pilot. As he went through the program, he got better and better. Because of his wrestling background, he had the ability to squeeze muscles and withstand higher gravity forces in the plane than some average pilots could. Boyington graduated as part of Marine Aviation Class 88C in September of 1937 and eventually stayed on at Pensacola as an instructor. He countered the tedium of flight training by hanging out at the officer's club bar. Though alcohol didn't appeal to him in high school or college, at Pensacola, he told his fellow pilots, I don't know why I stayed away from this stuff for so long, because it was made for me. And Lieutenant Gregory Boynton turned out to be a mean drunk. He'd pick out the biggest and ugliest looking person he could find and say, let's wrestle. He'd spring at you and just come on like a wild panther or lion. Boynton also began to display a growing disrespect for authority. After being assigned to Marine Squadron 1 at Quantico, Virginia, he and another pilot staged an impromptu mock dogfight over the base. 
Boyington's tank ran dry. He was unable to get back around, couldn't get the engine started, and had to make what's called a dead stick landing on the only flat, safe terrain that he could find. This turned out to be the rifle range. Meanwhile, Boyington was paying to keep his family off base. Now, with three children hidden from the military, he watched as his expenses grew far beyond his means. He had expensive uniforms to buy, and those uniforms amounted to hundreds of dollars. It would equate to thousands of dollars today. Plus the fact that, according to some of his peers, their bar tabs often exceeded their rent. In August of 1941, First Lieutenant Boyington's life in marine aviation finally spiraled completely out of control. He got in a fight with a naval lieutenant commander, a superior officer, over another woman. Boynton was placed under house arrest for five days. He could see the handwriting on the wall that this was going to be his last duty with the Marine Corps. His marriage broke up and Helene took their children back to Seattle. On August 6, 1941, in the air-conditioned bar at Pensacola's Hotel San Carlos, Boynton cashed a bad check, hoping to drink his problems away. A friend of his at the bar said, this is your lucky day. There's a man upstairs who's recruiting pilots to go over and fight for Chiang. In the 1930s, Chinese leader Chiang Kai-shek was trying to combat invading Japanese. Manchuria had been overrun in 1931, and the rest of China was being quickly and brutally taken over by Japanese troops. To combat Japanese aggression, influential warlord Chang and the U.S. government covertly recruited U.S. military pilots to fly as mercenaries in a new fighter outfit called the American Volunteer Group, later known as the Flying Tigers. Facing possible dismissal from the Marines, Boyington quickly seized on this unique opportunity. Because of his reputation and problems, the Marine Corps was almost as willing to let him go as Boyington was to resign and put his problems behind. In September 1941, Boyington found that he had the kind of right stuff the Chinese nationalist government was looking for. The 300 pilots and ground crew members of the Flying Tigers were organized and led by a no-nonsense former American Army Air Corps officer, Claire Chennault. They were going to be paid nearly three times the amount that they were currently receiving as military pilots. The fact that they would be paid a bonus of $500 for every Japanese plane that was destroyed, this was going to be big money. The pilots of the Flying Tigers flew the Curtis P-40 Tomahawk, a sturdy, although not highly maneuverable, single-seat fighter. Boyington instinctively handled the controls of the P-40 well, gaining the respect of his peers in the air. But on the ground, he began alienating many of his fellow flying tigers with his drinking and wild behavior. He could get drunk on two drinks. Poppy would come up to me, you know, and he would lean forward at about 30 degrees and put his fist in my mouth and say, give me one good reason why I shouldn't bust your teeth in. And so I'd say, good night, Bobby. The next day, he wouldn't even remember it. After the devastating Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th of 1941, Chenault unleashed his pilots on the Japanese in China. Boynton was frustrated almost from the beginning by the fact that a lot of the other pilots quickly racked up victories and got big amounts of bonus money. On February 6, 1942, Boyington's personal combat drought ended. Boyington and five other pilots of the Flying Tigers' Adam and Eve 1st Squadron attacked 35 Japanese Ki-27 Nates. They shot down 15 of them, with Boyington accounting for two downed Japanese planes himself, his first aerial victories in combat. In his next major fight, Boynton was part of a group who destroyed 15 Japanese planes, but all were on the ground, not facing the enemy in air-to-air -air combat. Boynton was one of the four shooters. The credit was divided equally 
amongst all 10 of the pilots who had taken part in the raid. He had seen that bonus money dwindle down to just $750. Boyington felt cheated out of money for four victories that he sorely needed to take care of his huge debts back in the United States. Those four planes destroyed on the ground would later become part of Boyington's own self-perpetuating legend. He was a hell of a good pilot. He was fearless. He could tackle anything. His only problem was, was a drinking problem, and that kind of messed his mind up. Angered over a perceived loss of more than $1,100, Boyington let his resentment build to the boiling point. In April of 1942, Chenault began talking about merging his pilots into established U.S. Army Air Force units. Boyington had joined the Flying Tigers with the idea that he would be able to return to the Marine Corps if the Flying Tigers were ever disbanded. With no interest in flying for the Army Air Force, Boyington quit the Tigers. What little money Boyington made in China, he spent getting back to the United States. Once back in the States, Gregory Boyington set to work to try to redeem his sullied image with the Marine Corps. In July of 1942, 29-year-old, seasoned, former Flying Tiger pilot Gregory Boyington disembarked the ship SS Brazil in New York City and promptly proceeded to Washington, D.C. He applied for reinstatement as an aviator in the Marine Corps. It took more than four months, but he finally talked his way into a major's commission. He started to talk about the fact that he had six victories as a flying tiger. Two victories were aerial, four victories that he thought he should have been paid for on the ground. So he established himself early on by embellishing the facts as an ace wherein the U.S. Naval Services have never recognized aircraft destroyed on the ground as part of a pilot's cumulative record. By late January 1943, U.S. forces were pushing their way north through the Solomon Islands. Guadalcanal fell to Navy guns and Marine rifle companies. Boyington was ordered to the Solomons area to serve the first of three six-week tours required of all Marine fighter pilots. At the end of the first combat tour, Boynton was relieved of his command by the air group commander, and their personalities also clashed. It was, again, one of those authority figures that Boynton just seemed to take offense to. But Admiral Bull Halsey, the commander of American forces in the Solomon Islands, was in dire need of more fighter plane squadrons. Through back channels, a new Marine fighter squadron was quickly assembled and Boyington was given command. The ad hoc outfit would eventually fight its way from the Russell Islands to Vela La Vela and Bougainville. His men were immediately taken with their unorthodox and tough-minded commander. He just seemed to have a, a will to win in everything, on the ground, you know, fighting, uh, arguing, or in the air with an airplane. It soon became apparent to us, too, that he was not popular with the other senior officers. And this tended to make us gel around him more because he turned more to us than he did to his peers. Of the first 29 pilots in Boynton's squadron, almost all of them had at least some college in their background. Paul Moon Mullen was a graduate of Notre Dame. Bruce Matheson enlisted after one year at the University of Illinois. This was, interestingly enough, one of the most qualified and highly capable squadrons just based on their level of experience, even though it hadn't been with that collective unit. Pilots Bill Heyer, Don Moore, and Chris McGee had started out with the Royal Canadian Air Force. Chris McGee was nicknamed Wild Man because on one of their early missions, he carried a grenade with him. And when they were attacking a barge or a, a small ship down in a cove, he had his canopy open and he pulled the pin on this grenade, chucked it out of the cockpit, and it went off right over the target. 
But there were many other combat-tested pilots in this hastily organized squadron with the same kind of killer instincts. Mo Fisher, Bob McClurg, Bill Case, all of these guys were aces. There were nine aces altogether, plus several others who managed to get not quite enough victories to become aces, but still the pilot set an incredible record. Having created this squadron from back channel methods, the outfit decided that they wanted to have their own name. They tested several. Boynton's Bastards was one that failed to make the cut. <laughs> but when they came to Black Sheep, it was widely accepted. Taking it a step further, the new Black Sheep designed their official insignia with a black bar cutting diagonally across the shield. And so they were able to use that symbol for illegitimacy in their squadron logo. The name they came up with, the Black Sheep, with a forlorn looking little lamb on the patch, was more appropriate to Boyington's reputation in the Marine Corps and also to the way that the squadron was formed. At the age of 30, Boyington was almost 10 years older than most of the pilots serving in his command. When you're 21, looking at 32 and 33 year old people, they are old folks. One of the correspondents started using the reference to Pappy in the media. And so before too long, he became Pappy Boyington. Reveling in their new nickname, the Black Sheep met the pilots of the Japanese Imperial Navy head on. On September 16, 1943, in the air over the heavily defended island of Balale, Boyington's 20 planes of the Black Sheep were providing air cover for 70 American and New Zealand dive bombers. The Black Sheep, when they were fighting in and around Rabaul, their primary opponents were the Zero fighter pilots from the 201st, the 204th, and the 253 Kokutai, or air groups. Of the three main units there, the, the toughest was the 253rd Kokutai. The Japanese naval carrier pilots had been fighting in the South Pacific since early 1942, almost a year longer than any of the black sheep. In the crowded skies over the island of Balali, these Japanese veterans proved to be deadly adversaries. About 20 or 30 Japs jumped us and it started a dog fight. It spread all over the sky and uh, maybe 10 miles by 10 miles. I was in the middle of the Japanese Air Force and it must have been 12 or 14 zeros. I was, I was right in the middle of them. I was chasing one uh, zero down at about 1,500 feet, he rolled over on his back and pulled a split ass right underneath me. My airplane wouldn't have done it. In their first fight as a squadron, the Black Sheep racked up 11 victories and eight probables, five of which were all-out victories scored by the steely-eyed Boyington. He took a group of uh, disparate pilots who mostly did not know each other, had uh, probably never flown together before, and in a matter of just a very few weeks, turned them into an extremely potent and effective uh, fighting organization. But back at the Black Sheep's new Russell Island airfield, Boyington paid little attention to the paperwork and administrative details necessary to running a fighter squadron. First Lieutenant Frank Walton, a former Los Angeles police officer, was brought in as the unit's intelligence, administrative, and unofficial press officer. Walton, in essence, ran the squadron every place but in the air. He kept it together. He saw to things. He did all the things that other squadrons had adjutants and so forth to do. Walton, secondarily, and possibly even more importantly, was the one who sort of rode herd on Boynton and tried to keep him from drinking too much and did a, a remarkable job of it because somehow Boynton was a, sort of like a liquor magnet. If there was liquor around, he found it. Sometimes when he took off in the morning, it, he just staggered out to an airplane. But uh, in the air, God, I'll tell you, it was something. Major Gregory Boynton and his black sheep raised the stakes during the air war in the South Pacific and became some of the most deadly fighter pilots in Marine Corps history. 
By mid-September of 1943, Major Gregory Pappy Boyington and the pilots of his Black Sheep Squadron had an impressive string of victories over the Japanese naval pilots in the South Pacific. With his five recent confirmed victories during the air battle over Balali and his six claimed victories with the Flying Tigers, Boyington was now considered a top ace. The independent-minded Boyington had definite and innovative ideas on how U.S. military aviation needed to best fight the Japanese. He pioneered the idea of fighter sweeps designed to lure the enemy into aerial combat. The fighter sweeps, unlike the bomber escorts, were purely air-to-air -air designed from the very, very start to find their fighters and shoot them down. 21-year-old Lieutenant John Bolt took Boyington's independent and aggressive fighting style very much to heart, single-handedly destroying a number of Japanese troop barges in the harbor at Bougainville. He later received a commendation from Admiral Halsey for that mission. Boyington had a knack of surrounding himself with the pilots. He liked, he liked the way they flew. And if you weren't aggressive, you didn't fly with Pappy Boyington. But the kind of spectacular success Boyington and his pilots achieved in the air battles over the South Pacific did not come without a price. The Black Sheep Squadron lost 10 pilots during the fall of 43. But Boyington himself seemed to be impervious to Japanese bullets. By December, Boyington was approaching the record of 26 aerial victories recently achieved by an old Pensacola friend. During the earlier campaign, over the skies of Guadalcanal in the Pacific War, a pilot named Joe Foss in the Marine Corps had tied Eddie Rickenbacker's record of 26 aerial victories. Boynton had 14 as a Marine from his first combat tour and then claimed that he had six victories as a flying tiger and a few days before Christmas downed four planes in one flight, which was another major accomplishment. So now he had 24. The former Flying Tiger and his command made for good headlines back home. Everyone wanted to know when he was going to break Joe Foss's record of 26 victories. Boyington could hardly come back from a mission without a microphone being thrust into his face. Major Gregory Boyington. In air battles, he shot down 25 Japs. And now, in a raid against Rabaul, the Marine Corps ace was going after that record of 26. Boynton was in really high spirits. And one of his pilots voiced some concern about Boynton, almost as if his, his flame was a little bit too bright, that he was starting to worry that Boynton was pushing too hard and was going to be shot down. But Boyington told his men, don't worry about me, they can't kill me. If you guys ever see me going down with 30 zeros on my tail, don't give me up. Hell, I'll meet you in a San Diego bar six months after the war and we'll all have a drink for old time's sake. On Monday, January 3rd, 1944, Boyington took off from Torokina Airfield on the island of Bougainville in command of 46 American fighters, including seven of his own black sheep, in a dangerous fighter sweep over Rabaul. Far from their home base, Boyington's fighters lured the Japanese pilots into a tumultuous battle. We were attacked by a fairly sizable number of zeros, well more than 10 or 12. It just broke up into a just a big gaggle, and I can recall seeing Boynton shoot down an airplane. The shooting down of that Japanese Zero raised Boynton's victory tally to 26 and tied him with Major Joe Foss. The irony was that Boynton and his wingman, George Ashman, did not come back from the mission. No one had heard of Boynton or Ashman. No one had reported anything. They had just disappeared. And over a period of hours, people all of a sudden came to the realization that he wasn't coming back. We mounted out search and rescue missions and so forth, but the last I had seen of him was when he'd shot down one airplane. 
It was a shock to all of us when he was, but he was the last person in the world that we thought would ever be shot down. Major Gregory Boynton disappeared into the St. George's Channel area on January 3, 1944. It was big news, demoralizing both Americans back home and the men of his Black Sheep Squadron. Though there was no actual confirmation of Boynton's death, America still mourned the loss of one of its most famous fighter pilots. We never expected that it would happen to him. All of a sudden, all of us, I'm sure I did in particular, felt very much more mortal and said, if this can happen to him, there's nobody better than he is in the air, that there but for the grace of God go I. The Marines still had a long and tough fight ahead of them on land and in the air. The bloody beaches at Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa became the final resting places for thousands of Marines. It would take nearly two more years of fighting in the Pacific before the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki brought Japan to its knees. On August 29, 1945, while American warships steamed into Tokyo Harbor, a swarm of U.S. Navy landing craft headed for Amore Island. The small island set inside Tokyo Bay was the location of a prisoner of war camp. As the landing craft approached the beach, scores of elated Allied prisoners of war swarmed out to greet their liberators. Among them was a grateful Marine Corps pilot, Major Gregory Boyington. He had been a captive of the Japanese since he was shot down nearly 20 months before. When he was shot down and theoretically lost, nobody ever really gave up. They said, if there's one guy that can make it, this old dude probably can, and by God, he did. Boynton had gone down fighting, and then, as he had always predicted, emerged like a phoenix from the ashes. The Marine Corps flew everybody they could, every black sheep they could get uh, to San Francisco for a three-day wild-ass party. They wheeled the portable stairway up to the side of the plane and flung open the door, and there he was. He was the first one off, and of course he came down the stairs, and we all grabbed him and threw him up on our shoulders and carried him over to the ready room where the press descended on him. 21 of his black sheep sat enthralled as he took them back to that fateful air battle almost two years earlier. He told them how he had shot down two more Japanese Zeros, breaking Joe Foss's record of 26 planes. Seeing his wingman swamped by Zeros, he dove his Corsair into the fray. But he suddenly found himself hotly pursued by almost a dozen Zeros. I was shot down between Ribal and New Ireland, you know, over the St. George Channel. At dusk, a submarine uh, surfaced just alongside of me, and I thought, oh boy, here we might be an American sub. Then I saw a tarpaulin stretched around a conning tower, and there on the side was painted a great big meatball. I says, oh, oh Boynton, the jig's up. Now a POW, Boynton was transferred among several local Japanese prisons before finally being sent to the Japanese mainland. After reuniting with the black sheep, he was quickly overwhelmed with adulation, promoted to lieutenant colonel, and informed that in his absence he had been awarded the Medal of Honor. On Friday, October 5, 1945, he stood before President Harry Truman and received the medal, along with 15 other Marine and Navy heroes, now proclaimed the Marine Corps' top ace. At 32, Boynton was on top of the world, but he quickly slid back into his old alcoholic ways. A Portland, Oregon newspaper reported Boynton assailing a war bond dinner crowd belligerently. He said, I know what you want me to talk about. You want me to talk about how I shot him down. I was flat on my back at 40,000 feet. That's what you want, isn't it? I'm here to sell war bonds. Buy war bonds. Why? I don't know. Just buy them. Within a few months, the Marine Corps managed to find a reason to work him into an early retirement. Almost overnight, Boynton was forgotten. 
For the next 12 years, he hopped from one dead-end job to another. He was a professional wrestling referee, beer salesman, insurance salesman, and part-time commuter pilot. But many other members of Boeington's former squadron continued on in the service. An ace in the South Pacific, John Bolt stayed in the Marine Corps, shooting down six North Korean MiGs during the Korean War. I'm the only jet ace in the Marine Corps, and the only two-war ace, double ace, in naval aviation. I uh, enjoyed the, uh, the combat, I liked it, just like hunting, as far as I'm concerned. Bruce Matheson also stayed in the Marine Corps and retired a colonel. And I went to Vietnam, where I was a commanding officer of a Marine aircraft group, a helicopter group. And I flew several hundred missions there in a Huey gunship with the, the uh, Huey squadron. The Black Sheep's wild man, Chris McGee, traveled an entirely different road. McGee continued being colorful after the war, flew for the Israeli Air Force, and used to say that wouldn't Willie Messerschmitt turn over in his grave if he saw the Messerschmitt being used by the Israelis against the Arabs. Occasionally, Boyington still lived up to his own colorful reputation. In 1949, at an American Legion aeronautics dinner, he found himself helping out as a bartender when he ran into his old friend, fellow Marine ace and Medal of Honor winner, Joe Foss. I said, Les Rassel, I always wanted to whip hell out of you. He reached around me and he put these knucks between my shoulder blades and I just kicked off that wall and we just plowed U.S. senators and, and dignitaries out of the way. Next morning, Boynton knocked on Foss's door talking about what kind of fun they'd had the night before and Foss just couldn't believe it. Boynton periodically made attempts at sobriety and went through two more failed marriages. In 1958, he wrote his memoirs, originally started years before, under the tutelage of his former administrative officer, Frank Walton. The book was published under the title, Baba Black Sheep. While he did take occasional liberties with the facts, such as perpetuating his inflated success with the Flying Tigers, his self-deprecating style made it a huge success. On the last page, Boyington quoted F. Scott Fitzgerald with what had become his own personal mantra, show me a hero and I'll prove he's a bum. The book eventually sold more than 100,000 copies. There was even talk of a major film set to star Robert Mitchum, but the project never made it to theater screens. Boyington, once again, found himself drifting back into obscurity. The drinking resumed, and his marriage failed, and he found himself struggling again for years and years. In 1976, the legend of Pappy Boyington and the Black Sheep Squadron was resurrected for a whole new generation with a one-hour network television show based very loosely on Boyington's own book. Boyington served as the show's technical advisor, though he actually provided little in the way of correct historical advice. It was not lost on Greg that if I got this show on NBC, that it was going to be good for him. The last thing in the world he was going to do is say to me, hey, wait a minute, you got to do it this way or that way. Then He had his eye on the bigger prize, you know, get this thing on the air. However you think you can get it on the air, that's fine with me. Just don't put me in a dress. But the men who had served valiantly with him during the war initially took great offense to their depiction as screwballs and misfits awaiting court-martial. It portrayed all of us as just a bunch of bombs. Uh, two things were factual about it. The squadron designation was 214, and the commanding officer was Greg Boynton. In the long run, we've done them a service, I think. They were heroes. I mean, that was a tough game they were in. I know it's hard to be portrayed as something other than what you really are, but uh, my, my excuse is I'm in the entertainment business. <laughs> The show started a new career for Boyington. He showed up on the air show circuit, where he sold and signed his books and charged for personal appearances. Yet, even in his late 60s, he occasionally went back to the bottle. At 68 years old, he was driving back to Fresno, and he got pulled over by two highway patrolmen, and he took them on, and they had to mace him. But even this hero, who once seemed to rise from the dead, was mortal. 
Living in Fresno, California in 1986, the 73-year-old Boyington was suddenly hospitalized with cancer. In January of 1988, Ned Corman and Fred Loesch, two former Black Sheep Squadron members, drove to Fresno to see their dying former commander. We walked in and here's Pappy in his bed and he's just horribly emaciated, just skin and bones. And I leaned over to him and said, Pappy, you get your butt out of here. You've been in tougher spots than this. And he says, well, Ned, he said, there are times when you get in a situation where the odds are completely against you and you can't do a damn thing about it. And I walked out of that room and the tears were just, I couldn't stop crying. On January 11th, 1988, at the age of 75, Colonel Gregory Boynton passed away quietly in his sleep. He was buried with full military honors in Arlington National Cemetery. He certainly was an icon. I mean, he was an icon because, to begin with, you know, icons are, have to be larger than life, and Greg was. Icons have to have cool nicknames, and Greg did. You can't be an icon and be a pretender, you know, because you'll get busted. And Greg wasn't a pretender. VMF-214, the Black Sheep Squadron, was the first Marine aviation unit to receive a presidential citation. Under Major Gregory Boyington's leadership, the 54 members of the Black Sheep shot down 97 Japanese planes during the course of their service in the South Pacific. Few pilots have worn the globe and anchor of the United States Marine Corps with more honor than the men of the Marine Fighting Squadron 214 during their service in World War II. Despite their colorful and often contentious commander, they were still a team. Their accomplishments flying those inexpensive, piston-driven Corsair fighters helped America decisively win the war in the Pacific. Out of the 54 in the two combat tours, we're getting down to a few. In fact, uh, I wonder who's going to fly the last mission. I hope it's me. 